Hey, welcome to the best of everything. I am Ruben Paul. Um, and across from me is not my brother. Well, he is my brother from another mother, but he's the special guest. Uh, Johnny Sanchez couldn't be here with us today, uh, but we have a wonderful guest. I know Johnny's going to be bummed that he uh, missed the guest I'm about to introduce, but um, he's one of the best at what he does in the business. That's why he's on the best of everything uh, from Lady Gaga to Michael Jackson to Whitney Houston. I can't even go into all the many artists you've worked with. Um, and I'm proud to call him a uh, friend. He's one of my closest friends. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, the fabulous music director, Mr. Michael Berry. <laughs> clap, Chris. You got to clap, Chris. And, you know, it's just me and you in here tonight. I clap me. I clap what up, Mike me. B? What up? Well, we, I mean, it's always interesting to do interviews with your friends because you basically know everything about your friends. I know, right? But the cool part is I know what questions that, to ask that um, people should know about. And one thing that me and you always talk about and one thing I want you to elaborate straight from the jump is, what is a musical director, and what does the musical director musical director do? Yeah, that's always the question that everybody because they have no idea yeah. what a music director is. Yeah, and so because people when they think of music, they think of the music producer who produces the original. Yeah, tracks, et cetera, so et cetera, et cetera. Are, you, are you in a studio with her? Yeah, like, you know those are the questions I get. So basically, if I can just do the cliff note version, music director is. <laughs> it will sound silly. The the director of the music, meaning so like you have a director for a film, yeah, and they're in charge of the actors, framing the shots, mm -hmm. you know, making sure all of that the script is you know executed in properly, manner, properly. You yeah. know, so that's, and, and let me not to cut you off, yeah. but the music director thrives in live shows, correct? Thrives in live shows. Well, yes, that basically that's that's where yeah. you're. But you're there's needed. so many different kinds of music directors too okay so like i was a music director for the emmys mm -hmm. so there's different way but you're right the music director thrives in live music but in a pop artist sense um there's the pop artist and there's the music director yeah and the creative director is there you know the choreographer is there but the music director is there you can't dance or you can't light you can't do anything unless you have the music so mm -hmm. um there, I'm in charge of the music, so you know when Michael. So you're in charge of arrangements and all that kind of thing. So when MJ, you know, what asked me, I want to do this song, but and I when can't. he's talking about MJ, he's talking about Michael Jackson. That's what he's talking <laughs> about. And if you guys saw the movie, this is it. Right. Uh, Michael is featured in the movie because he was Michael Jackson's musical director. So go ahead. Yeah, it, it, that's funny. You just point that out because when I say it I'm just saying it because of course, yeah because it's your homeboy but, it's like, you know somebody you work with and you it's know so funny. it's like it's, MJ it's, it could be Magic Johnson Michael Jordan is like nah the first MJ I know I did a gig in DC a long time ago it was like a jazz thing that Quincy Jones did it was all these luminaries in in the band and so we were on the bus we were on our way to the vice president's house I think <laughs> See how casually you said that, Chris. And, oh, going to the uh, vice president's house, yeah, I guess. And, and Quincy's on the on the on the in the van in the bus with uh, whatever they have for us, with all these families. He goes, "Hey man, remember you and me and Berg went to to a place right there down the street down there. We had some food, and I'm just like Charlie Parker." And oh, he, that's and, and, he, and he, they just doesn't know national. They were so saying it so matter of factly, but I just forget that's their lives. So that's when when I say stuff is yeah, it's, it's like no, nah, dude, you gotta <laughs> you gotta put some explanation yeah, behind that. No, no, no. But so so yeah, so MJ. Like, so for instance, we we're gonna do a medley of Jackson Five hits, and mm -hmm. um, you know we couldn't do all of them because they had too many. So you know I have to arrange that, and MJ will say to me, well, you know. You gotta take that key down a little bit. I'm not five anymore. You know, like that. <laughs> I'm not five. <laughs> no, dude was a superstar at five, six Isn't years old. Isn't that crazy? That's so crazy. So, so that's the job of a music director is to you know, make sure the arrangements are good, make sure the artist is cool, with how they sing it, you know, tempos, all of that. Mm -hmm. Rehearse the band, you know, that kind of. Thing. So, let's just jump right into it because we started with MJ. How did the job of becoming, how does Michael Jackson find you? Like, I know your name is floated around in the industry because mm -hmm. you started at, when did you start working professionally in this business? Oh my, Whew. okay. Well, I started playing when I was like five, six years old. Mm -hmm. Piano, I'm from the South Side of Chicago. South Side. Yes, sir. And um, 
Five or six years old. Five or six years. What's old. your first memory? My first memory of playing. Of playing? Yeah. Oh man. Did you? Is it something that your parents encouraged you to do, or <laughs> they just woke up one morning and you're on the banging keys on the piano? Well, like, uh, how did that transpire? Did they buy you toys? Did they nurture no. this gift, or it just kind of happened? Uh, it kind of happened. Uh, I remember. I, well, I think before I started playing piano, I was in in my grandmother's house in um, Tennessee, where my father's from. Mm -hmm. And it was that old piano in the back room. And I just got on it and just started picking out melodies and they just ran from the front room where they were. I was like, who's playing this piano? So wow. I was very young. But the story is, my, and my mom tells it really great, is my father came home one day and just was like, you know, not having it, it was like you gonna you you gonna play piano and you talking to my brothers and like, uh -huh. you gonna do this, Michael. You gonna play piano. And so he kind of just like forced forced it because he wanted us to have some kind of skill and some kind of talent, some kind of trade, some kind of way to help. You know, education too was also big in the house, but mm -hmm. just to get, you know, to not be of that environment. Was your father involved in the music industry? No, not at all. Not at all? Not at all. Wow. Not even in the slightest. Really? Uh, he's, a, he was a, he's an artist. He's a painter, a mm -hmm. photographer and all that. So he was creative, um, still and he, is. And he obviously had a love for music. Had, had a great love for he's music. He's like, my boys are going to play some yeah, music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom, and my mom tells us, she was like, she was scared, like petrified. Like, oh my God. So, and so I took to it. And so um, my second mom, who I call my godmom, who's my mom's best friend, mm -hmm. um, taught me when I was very young because they wanted to see if I wanted to take to it. So she taught me what she knew. Mm -hmm. um, and so I learned from her and then I had the books. And I mean, I was bit as soon as I started. I mean, really? I, I've always known I wanted to be in music since I was even before that. Wow. Like probably three years old. So what what was your journey from just dabbling on the piano? Were you like winning talent contests in school or did somebody see you? Were you playing in the church? Like what happened to lead you to a life to be a professional musician a if no one crime. in your family yeah <laughs> if no one in your family was really in the industry like it's always fascinating like people yeah. will ask me like yeah how did you end up doing comedy your parents are from haiti they knew nothing about the entertainment industry right and it just came from you know my love of watching I tv i asked you that yeah the, but we'll talk about that exactly but, no but, about you today no, <laughs> no that's but that's that's right and so it, especially for me as a young boy i was very shy and very quiet mm. like i would be in a room and my my mom would say sometimes i just make a move and she would be startled because she didn't even know i was there that's how you're just sitting there quiet. i'm just sitting there quiet and so to to go from that to being the music director the leader yeah of these mega mega stars is, yeah. is an amazing journey. And so it just kind of happened uh, when I was in school. So my earliest memory of music is Aretha Franklin. So, you know, the babysitter we used to have would play stuff on the, on the record play and we'd just be running around the house. And whenever she played Aretha Franklin, for some reason, I just sat down and was quiet. Like, wow, who is this? That's the what, powerful command the of voice. The powerful command of voice and yeah. just literally sat down and listened to her. Like, this is amazing. What, mm -hmm. what is this doing to me? And so from that, it started in school pretty much. Um, and I didn't, you know, what's funny about it, piano, I didn't start playing piano in school. There was, I, I remember the music teacher in my elementary school came in one day and said, well, who wants to be in the band? And then everybody kind of raised their hand. Then they said, well, what instruments do you want to play? And they were handing out saxophones and trumpets and all that. And then for some reason, I didn't get a chance to pick any of those instruments. So uh -huh. the only thing that was left was drums. Oh, and wow. So I was like, okay, I'll play the drums. And then so I started playing. Were you drums. the only black kid in the school? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're the black kid in the, the drums. No, well, they got rhythm. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, this is what we do all the time. I just laugh because he's such a great comedian. He's, like, he's just naturally funny. Uh, I know, but no, it was it was a black school. It was in a black girl. Oh, okay. So, okay. South side. Oh, but, but, it was, but it was mixed, though, because it was like a magnet school. So mm. there was all kinds of diversity even back then dope. um so yeah it really was dope it really was dope and i remember the music teacher's name mr leslie one of my favorite people ever on the planet so i started playing drum i had no idea how to play drum we had drums at home like uh -huh. yeah <laughs> it's just you got sticks and you, you got, got rhythm sticks, got, and so we just started figuring it out and so we wouldn't even go out at recess with the band would rehearse 
uh, practice at, at, at recess time. And That's it's crazy. Like, it's crazy. So. I don't think that was even offered at my school. Like That's such I, a shame. Yeah, I didn't, like music wasn't introduced to, I'm trying to think in junior high. My, my earliest uh, memory of music was, uh, was high school, like 10th grade. And wow. I remember I played the drums and it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me the little little drum pad. There's like a little drum pad. Oh. And they they teach you how to hold the sticks and you know, I'm like, dude, I'm gonna play ball. I don't wanna be in the band. <laughs> you know what I mean? I you know, I'm Why hood, did but, you wanna be in the band? You know, I love music, but you know, it was a lot of peer pressure. You know when you grow up in the hood, yeah. there's just so much peer yeah. pressure. So I yeah. always respect when somebody like, dude, if you even wanted to be an actor. You know, in high school, oh, people they, would clown you. Oh, you know they what, I mean? what you, you going to be in the drama? You going to be, you know? Listen. So it's like. It, I'm it's, not saying I didn't get clowned. Of, yeah. I got clowned. Yeah, isn't that interesting? It's, it's, I got clowned. And, uh, and why is that when culturally, you know, our culture thrives in music, but for some reason there's a stigma when it comes to like, you know, being in drama when you're a kid or being in, you know, playing instruments or being in the band. Like, you know, because they call them band geeks and I stuff mean, like we that. Would call, we would call every on the side side. I, I, I was called more than that yeah, <laughs> at, a young, at a young age. And it's it's so it's so amazing, too, because that's how we're socialized. And it's I mean, basically, I just be blunt about it. People are just ignorant. Like, yeah. You, you, if you don't know, you don't know. And mm -hmm. so. I'm not giving them excuses, but, and it wasn't even that kind of school because the, the kids there were like, they were like drama kids, they were, mm. you know, band kids. Was it like a performing It arts? wasn't, no, oh. I, didn't go, I didn't go to that till later, but it was, it was that we, we were from the hood. I mean, I got clowned. I, was, I remember being in the, the glee club. Or the, uh, <laughs> the glee the, club. The, the, uh, <laughs> we started singing, I got clowned so bad. I mean, I got damn near bullied every day. So. How did you transition from the drums to uh, piano? Well, like, there's no piano well, in the was, band, right? No, this, well, I mean, yeah. I'm going to walk around with a piano. <laughs> like, they have you, like, on a little float. Yeah. Yeah. You playing the piano. <laughs> and uh, now, the piano solo by Michael Beard. <laughs> well, first of all, you couldn't hear it. It was no mics, but, you know. Yeah. Um, you know what? I never stopped playing the piano, so I would play the piano at home. At home, okay. Um, and my mom would tell me stories like because you know, especially back then when you're getting teased and bullied and all that you know th that was my escape mm -hmm. because i was a quiet and a shy kid and introverted um music just was my escape so yeah. especially on the weekends when i didn't have to do homework or something after we do our chores and clean up the house and all that stuff i was on the piano everybody's out I was playing football. I'm not. I'm not saying I didn't play. Like I was. I was on baseball teams and mm -hmm. all that stuff. But you just had a, a passion for for I mean, music that at thing, that eight, young 10, age. 12 hours, man. My mom was. Why don't you go out like regular kids? Go outside. I'm like. I'm not a regular kid. Like. Did you, you just knew like when you were playing the piano? Were you practicing certain songs? Or were you just like freestyling? Or what? What were you? All what's of that. Your process. All of that. So what I was doing as a kid was so when they finally saw I was serious, they would you know, and we weren't destitute poor mm -hmm. but we definitely weren't rich yeah so money for piano lessons and stuff like you got to be serious about that because mm -hmm. we're not spending money on stuff yeah that we don't have it for so uh, after they saw i was serious they would just give me lessons and you know i go on the weekends and take my lessons and i come home and practice that but once i practice the lessons um classical then um I used to ask my mom for sheet music. We ain't got no money for no sheet music. <laughs> Put that radio on on the piano. She's like, here, listen to the radio. You learn that. Wow. And so I was like, how am I supposed to do that? She said, I don't know if people, other people do it. <laughs> so she I started, forced you to play by uh, ear. Huh? Forced me to play by ear. <laughs> That's when being broke comes in handy. <laughs> I know, right? Being broke just made you like, nah, we ain't going to go out and buy no sheet, sheet music. music. Use yeah. them ears God gave you. Yes. Yeah. That's basically it. And so um, my mom don't, probably don't even remember that, but she, we put... She put the radio and so I would just learn how to play by ear from the wow. radio from the stuff that I like to play and I just figure it out. Um, and then my dad bought me a radio with a cassette. So I was able to record it when the radio was so I can back, you know, go back and forth. And so and then I just started making up my own songs. Mm. And just started composing at a young age. Didn't even know that, that that's, that's what, what the, doing. I was doing, just making up things. So So like a lot of uh, guests that we've had on there uh, had on here. Uh, me and Johnny have asked him, like, what what were, like, some defining moments or turning points? Like, what led you 
to playing professionally? Like we talked about your journey, you dabbling, you know, learning, teaching yourself how to play the piano, learning to play by ear, playing in high school. What was the the break or turning point that got you like your first gig where you started playing publicly? Mm, so the the elementary school I went to um, was almost like a sister school to the high school that I went to. The high school I went to was called Whitney Young. And Whitney Young was a magnet high school mm -hmm. um, that you kind of had to audition to get in. So when I was in elementary school, I made a tape to get, in, you know, audition tape to try to get into the school. <laughs> and I made it with two cassettes. So I played the drums in my, in my mom's basement and then put that tape in another tape and then played the bass on top of that. Damn. And, it, and then on top of that, I played the keyboard. So that was my audition tape. To wait, get wait, it. wait, wait. You played the, the bass, yeah, the so, drums, and the piano? Yeah. So Wait, wait. We, we got to go back. When the <laughs> hell did you start playing the bass? Okay. So so what happened is, and, and so this is the journey. So from, from elementary school, um, even though I was getting teased, I still stuck to it. Mm-hmm. And so then we started finding kids in the neighborhood that played because they used to have block parties and we used to have battle of the bands, all that stuff growing up. Mm. So I got, you know, uh, my brother started with playing guitar and then my other two brothers you know, sang and played congas. And, and then we had some kids in the neighborhood play drums, bass. Um, Johnny, Mark, Brian, I remember all these people. And so Brian played the trumpet. And so we just made a little band called Magic. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. Magic. With the press on t-shirts that you iron on. Like, you guys have Magic on the t-shirts? Yeah. My dad has a photo, I have to find, I have to find that oh, photo. Oh, if you can find that photo, that would be dope. And I'm a little kid, like I'm like 10 years old, and so I didn't know at the time that this was being a music director, but so we get in and we, we try to figure out how to play songs and then nobody know what to do. So I was just like, you play this, you play that. So I'm like, being the music director wow at that early at age. 10 10 years old like telling them you know these kids were older than me mm -hmm. how to play so it started it started with that and we're playing in the neighborhood and playing these little block parties and little league parties and that little thing and so then after i made that audition tape the band director there at, at the high school the name is ivory brock um we're just like you have something young man so we're going to have you come in and play drums in the B band. I wasn't in the A band yet. So I was a freshman and I'm playing in the B just so I can learn that because I think because I still was shy and quiet, like mm -hmm. I had to learn yeah. how to get through that. But I was in B band for like a couple of weeks and then he just put me back up in the A band. So then I just started learning orchestra and all that, that stuff in high school. He was an amazing band director from, he went to um, Grambling. And what was his name? Ivory Brock. Ivory Brock. Shout I out Ivory Brock. Ivory. And so so in that high school, we had a crazy high school with Michelle Robinson, who's now Michelle Obama. Um, oh, you went to school with Michelle Obama? Yes. Me, me. I know that, but I got to act like that. <laughs> wow, you went to school with Michelle you Obama? School, you know, we so had, you know Michelle Obama? I absolutely know Michelle. And so, know. Um, <laughs> Isn't that crazy to be it's so in school crazy. with somebody and be have this friendship and then they become the first lady of the United States of America and the first black first lady it's, of we, the United We can States get to America. that part of I the know, story. Dude, it's, it's, so, it's so surreal for me and it's so amazing. What's even more amazing is it, nothing has changed between us Yeah, as far as the, the, the friendship. friendship. Yeah, she's still the same person. Nothing has changed. Now, that, see, to me, that's a testament to her character and the person that she is. Absolutely. Because we know people who get on a sitcom <laughs> that's been canceled after a year and then they change. You know I, what I mean? I was on the episode of That's My Mama. Yeah. yeah. Was, <laughs> the I going down episode going of down. That's My Mama. <laughs> Shout out Arsenio. Uh, <laughs> right. And, and, and they change. And here it is, someone that has become the, the, you know, the first lady of the United States of America and is still the it's same person still, to you like still hey mike how you doing you know that it's it's so amazing cuz like, you you played at uh, his inauguration uh, at, yes at i did i did both of his inaugurations so then how did that come about was that through michelle or was that no well us? it's funny so um michelle and i in in high school um toward the end of high school became very very close mm -hmm. so um was she into music and stuff too in high school, or she was on a whole different track? She was being Michelle. Okay. Um, she was she was always tall in high school. I thought she was always beautiful. She was always smart. Mm -hmm. um, 
she's and, she's brilliant yes yeah, she's she's always been brilliant you know and and her family was like i was always intimidated intimidated by her dad her dad was like a no nonsense kind of guy and I, <laughs> I was just like and then her brother craig you know was tall big back then and so michelle i would go visit her but he's her. the one that was a basketball coach mm-hmm. correct yes yeah. yes correct and so i go by the house and uh, me and michelle would be studying and I, you know, the father was just like, <laughs> <laughs> y'all better be studying in there. Yeah. Y'all better be studying. Don't be making no love songs for my oh, daughter. Oh, <laughs> man. Like, like, seriously. And so, and yeah, and we actually liked each other. And so she would come visit me when I, I went to Howard University. Mm-hmm. And she was at Princeton and she'd come down and, and visit. So we, we became very, very close. And so then when she was going to, to Harvard, um, you know, we kind of lost, we didn't lose touch, but yeah. we, your life's had, going different directions. Well, different paths, different mm-hmm. pathways. Um, but we were always friends, but I was on my music track, and she mm-hmm. was on her lawyer track. And, um, you know, we talk every now and then. And so then by, when I graduated from Howard, I moved to, to New York. And so that's a whole long story, too. But so just, I mean, that's what we're here for. Okay, brother. well, we, okay, we, can get to, we can get to that. I'll come back to that. Okay. So, um Fast forward to the story, I'll talk about the inauguration, then I'll come back to New York. Um, I got, I, I have, was doing the, the Kennedy Center Honors, mm-hmm. and so I was- explain to them what the Kennedy Center The are. Kennedy Center Honors are the, the honors that they do every year for, I think it's like five artists in these different disciplines, like uh, there's some operatic, there's you know bands, that, there's actors, there's dancers that get you know, Honor. uh, honored at mm-hmm. the Kennedy Center, uh, John F. Kennedy Center in Caroline, the, the daughter of John F. Kennedy, uh, is in charge of that. And so they honor these, you know, amazing artists. Do you remember who was um, honored the year that you did it? I did it 12 years. Oh, you've done it for 12 years? Yeah. Wow. So, who are some of the people that have been honored? Oh, since my been God. Done? Well, I did it for a bunch of presidents. Well, the first year I did, I was still at Howard and Reagan was the president. Whoa. And so I was in the choir of, of Howard. And we sang there for whoever it was. I, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. And so then when I started, Jesus. then when I started doing them, uh, there's so many like Jesus from 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 Led Zeppelin to Buddy Guy to Carlos Santana to Diana Ross, James Brown. And, and what was the transition? Beach Boy. <laughs> what was the transition? From being at Howard singing to the choir, singing in the choir, then being the musical director for the Kennedy. Like, this is cr- your journey is crazy. No, dude. it's, 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 it, it, I don't even know how that started, how I got to the, the Kennedy Center Honors. But so the band and, you know, the, the producer, his name is Michael Stevens, he's passed away a few years ago now. Uh, George Stevens was his dad who invented the, the Kennedy Center Honors, actually. And so they were approached as producers to do the concert at the Lincoln, uh, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial for Obama's inauguration. So I was asked to participate and help and do all that. And so um, I was there and I did it. I remember I got really, really sick because that, that year in DC, it was really cold for some reason and uh, it never got that cold. And I had 103 fever one day. And I was like falling out in rehearsal, and they were just like, "You got to go home." And I was like, "No, I'm gonna go to the hotel. Y'all gonna find me a doctor. Y'all mm-hmm. gonna Frankenstein me up. Yeah, and inject you with whatever. They yeah, because I'm not with. missing this inauguration. Yeah. And so, like, I wish somebody had taken a photo. That the doctor came in, had IVs on hangers <laughs> in my bedroom. Like, wow. Just like it was crazy. Then I was dehydrated. So you know, but I got there. I was still sick, but I went to do the show. We do the show, and on the show was like Mary J. U uh, two Bruce Springsteen, um, Herbie Hancock, Pete Seeger, uh, John Mellencamp, uh, Stevie. Uh, there was so many people on that show, and so we do the show and we do the inauguration. and Everybody's elated, and so I see Barack and Michelle are doing a receiving line on the steps. Now I'm on the steps where Martin Luther King did "I Have a Dream" speech, mm. right? Yeah. This is this is 2009. This is how crazy this is for me. And so I see them receive, and I was like, there's no way I'm not going to not say hi yes. to my friend Michelle, who I had not seen in years wow. at that point. And so I get up, and I just jump in front of everybody, Denzel, everybody, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so Michelle comes down, and this is how, so Barack came first, and I get in, and I, sh- I shake his hand, and he stops. 
because I hadn't seen him. Michelle actually introduced me to him when they were dating. Mm -hmm. And so I saw them on the East Coast somewhere. And um, I hadn't seen him since they got married. I was actually invited to their wedding to perform and play. I could not make it because I was with Whitney. Ah, uh, okay. And so... Whitney uh, Houston, and so, not, see, not Whitney from Compton. I, I usually call her Nip. <laughs> Nip, yeah. yeah um, not Nipsey Hussle, but Nip. Um, um, rest in peace to both of them. Man, but so um, uh, Jesse Jackson's daughter, Santita, asked me to play piano for her because we were all good friends. She went to high school with us too, um, with Michelle. And um, so she's like, can you play for me? She's a great singer. Mm -hmm. uh, and at Michelle's wedding, and Michelle was, is all excited, and then I was like, "Yeah, that would be so dope." And, yeah. But I couldn't do it, and so. Were you you were touring with, <coughs> uh, with Whitney Houston at the time? I think I was I was with Whitney or Whitney was uh, I can't remember exactly, but I I know I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I was in Europe, either it was right when Whitney was about to get married, or um, I was working with Rochelle Farrell at that time too. Uh, Rochelle was, Farrell. When, when, You're when, talking about someone who could sing. Oh yes. Yes. Who can, I mean, she's her a singer, voice, singer. man. Yeah. Jeez. She's a singer. Unbelievable. Singer. Yeah, Shelly was amazing. So I was, when, when Nip was about to get married, um, which is another long story, because I missed her wedding, which I was, I was so this upset. This was to Bobby? Yes. Oh, okay. I was so upset about it, though, because Nip was like a big sister to me. I actually credit her with saving my life. That's another story. Yeah. But so anyway, I couldn't make Misha's wedding, and, and so I didn't play. So I, I get up on the stage. And so Barack shakes my hand. He knows it's me, but he don't, you know, he's the pre he's president. Yeah, he's he's about to yeah, be sworn so, in. So he's just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so then he walks down, he keeps talking to people. So Misha comes down and she grabs my hand. She doesn't know it's me. She's talking to like, so you like she's talking to you. Mm -hmm. She's like, no, 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 no. She just, this is how gracious she is. Like, I'm coming to you, but I'm talking. Yeah, I'm holding your you hand. Yeah. I'll be to you in a second. Blah, blah, blah. She's talking, then she talks, then she turns around, she sees me, she does my head she's like Michael what <laughs> so she's like couldn't control it oh my and goodness and so and then like, right away when she's like screaming people uh you know you see dudes like yo first lady. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> so, someone... yeah, yo what, what's up with this dude right here so then she yells to her mom Mary like um mom it's Michael and then she goes like Michael from home so she comes over then I'm hugging her and me and so Barack is down, like, like who is this dude? <laughs> yeah, we got hugging, work to do. I got to my wife yeah. and my mother-in-law. And so Michelle said, "Does she, this is she's so amazing? She, she's like, she motions to Barack and goes, it's Michael from Chicago, from home.' And so Barack does the coolest thing. He stops shaking hands and he runs over to me." And kind of like jogs. Does that, does and that, and yeah, his little president yeah, his job. His little president job. <laughs> and he hugs me. And they got photos of this too. And, oh, um, wow. And he was like, oh, you, should, you should send us the photos so we can put them on Oh, the I show. definitely will do that. I'll and then um, I thought that was you. And we we talking. And I'm just like, I'm so proud. I was like, I said, first of all, I said, I hope you appreciate this. He's like, well, I said, dude, it's cold out here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sick. And I'm sick. And he started laughing. And then we just talk. I said, you the first black president, dude. And he was like. You know, yeah, and so he was just like, "Well, I gotta keep shaking hands." I said, "Yo, just do it for him." He said, "Chicago style," and I was like, "That's what's up." Yeah. So, um, you, you play both at, um, inaugurations for for Barack Obama. Um, let's go back to what was your first professional gig, or let's just how'd you connect with so, Whitney? So, um, Whitney. Oh, okay. So after high school, so I had bands in high school, and we play. You know, that's I guess that's my first taste of being professional mm -hmm. is when you get paid to play. Yeah. And so we were getting paid to play in high school with the band that we had. And so when I went to Howard. Was this still magic? or this No, magic was gone. Magic ago. was gone. Was magic, <laughs> magic lost his magic. We lost our magic. No, we had a whole, had a whole new crew. Well, you know, the, a lot of those guys wanted to do like you. They, they were like, we ain't into music. We want to play sports and do gotcha. all that kind of thing. So they just, you know, didn't want to be in a band anymore. So I didn't want to stop, so I just got guys who didn't want to stop, mm -hmm. and so we had a whole new crew. And then you got a, a scholarship to Howard, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the band director came in, and um, his name is Fred Irby, um, which is amazing because I still play shows with him. He's a band; he's a, a really great trumpet player, and he, he's like a first call guy in D.C. And he's he he can he comes out and plays. The what Oscar. does it mean when when someone's the first call? Guy? So. Um, 
So when he's a trumpet player and you have shows to play at like the Kennedy Center or wherever in, in D.C., um, you know, he'll get the first call. Mm. He'll get a call, you know, like, oh, okay. you know, gotcha. Misha Fred is on the, on the gig, you know, so. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, a contractor out here used to love him, too. So he would come out and do the Oscars and Emmys and stuff. So it's funny because he would he was in the orchestra and he's there i'm either leading it or playing and that was your and that was teacher. my my <laughs> teacher and yeah. he would brag about it he's so proud and all that and so as he should be it's so amazing and and um so he came and saw me in high school play and asked my mom and where's he going to, going to school you know like we don't know he said, we'll give him a scholarship to go to howard he's like he going to howard you know? <laughs> <laughs> i got no money to be paying to go to school you know sheep music <laughs> <laughs> yeah no he's going to howard so i got a scholarship to go to howard to play in fred irby's you know jazz band which recorded um we have albums which is really great to do because Every now and then I'll look, I don't I don't necessarily listen to stuff that I play on or if it's on the radio. I had a conversation with a friend of mine the other day. Like I don't just sit in the car and dig myself, like, ooh, listen to me. Like yeah. I've never been that kind of dude. But it's nice to have it when you were in college to see one, how you look, two, just to hear what you sounded like, just to have that time travel stamp That's amazing. In, in your life. So, you know, I did we did albums in school and um i've seen those pictures too because they look crazy yeah and um so that that was cool but what i discovered was you know i was good in all that in chicago but it was a whole lot of good people from all around the country when mm -hmm. i came out, i said like, oh i need to learn more and so that's what happened so after after college which i was gigging all through college i till three in the morning had eight o'clock classes mm -hmm. like go home sounds like stand up it's like you you know, you, you got to pursue your passion at the same time. You got to do real life stuff. You have to, because I had, had a job at the time. Yeah, well, I had no <clears throat> desire to do anything else. In but my music, life. yeah. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I went to school and I was, you know, my, my father's a professor. Um, and he's, you know, I watched him go from being a bus driver to becoming a PhD while I was a kid. So, wow. um, and he still teaches and has classes and all that stuff. He doesn't want to retire. Um, and why should he? Yeah, he still got knowledge, and he still and he has to have passion and he for still it. Still has passion for it. So yeah. and so, but I didn't want to go into the family business. Like I didn't want to be a teacher. Yeah, in that way, in a classroom and all that kind of thing. So I had no desire to do that. Although I went to school for that um, in piano. So I, t I packed up all my stuff. I was gigging in D.C. and doing quite well, and I could have stayed there, but I had bigger ambitions, and I pick packed all my stuff and moved to Brooklyn. Um, didn't know anybody in New York. Moved and shared a three-story walk-up, no kitchen. <laughs> sharing, a, sharing a bathroom with a family that lived down the hall. Wow. And I was in New, because I just was in New York. I just yeah. wanted to you be just there. knew you wanted to go to New York. That's where everything was happening. Mm -hmm. And so, where you know, they say, if you can make it there, you can make, make it, it anywhere. anywhere. So I was like, okay, let me see if I can make it there. Yeah. And so when I got there, I was, you know, struggling. And I could go back and forth to D.C. and work and make some money. But by the time you make the money, then drive back up and pay all the tolls. And the guys like, how much do you have left? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I got to stay here and make this work. So I just stayed there. And um, a friend of mine was playing with this uh, legendary flautist named Herbie Mann. And so I saw in the Village Voice, that's how long ago this was. Village Voice doesn't even exist anymore. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, um, that they were playing. So I call I called down to the club and I left a message with somebody, probably like a busboy or something. It was like, yo, can you tell the drummer that Michael Bearden called? Here's my number. You know, there was no smartphones and all that yeah. stuff back then. I'm like, who's gonna get that call? Well, he got the call and he called me back. He's like, dude, what you doing? I was like, I live in New York now. He's like, yo, come to the show. I'm like, I don't have no money. <laughs> so like, yo, dude, Put me I, on list. yeah, it's like I got you, man. Like, just come down. So I spent my money. I went down, and this is the funniest thing. I'm, I'm watching the show, and I could see that the guitar player and the and the, uh, the Herbie were like kind of beef like musicians you can tell i guess you could tell like when somebody's beefing on the stage like mm. you can tell when it's not it ain't they're flown. not in sync it ain't in sync and so i go backstage after the show and i see my friend I'm like yo what's up with that it's like yo they having a problem as a matter of fact isn't that crazy that you can sense that musically you can watch them and go oh those two don't like each other oh my that's how it is well music is that's a shared 
you know, uh, emotion, that's mm. shared energy, that's shared vibration. And, you can, and, and if you're in tune as a musician, like you can see who's off as a comedian. Like, yeah. That's what we do. So you can see it. You like, can you see, could, yeah. Maybe the audience couldn't tell or maybe they could. Yeah, the, the audience probably can't tell because I know comedically sometimes, even when you're judging your own personal performance, mm. you kind of know when you're off. The audience has no idea. Right. But you know when you get off time, like, man, I didn't do this. No, absolutely. This. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting that you can see that there was conflict just based on how they were playing. Just based on how they were playing. You could see there was conflict. Mm. You could see it. You could feel it. So and you go backstage? I go backstage and I t and he, said, he introduced me to Herbie. He goes, yo, this is my friend Michael. He's a great keyboard player. He's like, you should really listen to him. And so Herbie goes to me, he said, do you know no music? And I was like, I can. He said, you know, in a week we're going to be in Baltimore, you know, I'll give you an audition. So I go down to Baltimore with my friends and learn all this music. And I, like, I was hungry. Yeah. I come in, he comes in, you know, we play a tune, boom, play another one, boom, play another one, boom. And I never will forget this. He goes over to his case, he pulls out a calendar. From so-and-so to so-and-so, we're going to be in Kansas City. From so-and-so to so-and-so, we're going to be in Hawaii. I was like, does that mean I have the gig, Mr. Man? From so and so to so and so, we're gonna be. It's like, it's like they're like, you better start writing this down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Write them days down. I, and I got the gig. Wow. And so from there, I was playing festivals with like Dizzy Gillespie and Stanley Turrentine and all. How old were you during this time? Like 20? 20. Yeah. Like 20. And so um, just going around the world, I had never been to Hawaii. I, when I first gigs there, it was like three weeks in Hawaii at this club. <laughs> Jeez. Off on Monday. Like, <laughs> that don't sound like the gigs I started Oh, my doing. God. I was just there. I was, just, I was at the townhouse. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I had to go through those gigs yeah, to I'm get sure. to that Oh, absolutely. absolutely. All them, all them, man. Isn't I, that crazy? People don't even realize all the shitty gigs you have to do where you're being disrespected by the audience just to get to where you are now. It's so it's, it's the journey, and it's necessary. It's so necessary, though. Yeah. It's true because, you know, I remember playing in D.C. when I was – with this band, you know, on New Year's Eve, and it was, at the end of the night, it was like three drunk people in there, and you still have to perform. <laughs> you still have to go. I remember, yeah. I remember playing gigs. It was this violinist named uh, Noel Pointer. He used to play a blue violin, uh, a black violin. It's really very popular in the in the late seventies, early eighties. And I used to play with Noel all around the city and a lot of places. Mm -hmm. um, he was on uh, GRP, which is David and Dave Grusin and Larry Rosen's. Uh, record label, which was famous back then. He had Angela Bofill, Phyllis Hyman, all these people. Okay. And so I remember playing in this club in, in, in Jersey called Terminal D, and the comedian opening them for us was Bill Bellamy. Wow. Bill Bellamy would open, and then wow. and then we play. And this was, the, I mean, it probably was no bigger than this studio, this, this club. But I was like this little crazy club. But, you know, you just do all these kind of gigs to get – to get to where you have mm -hmm. to get to, you have to learn how to perform and be in front of people. So, so, so you're you're touring the country with this guy, which seems like it was your first. Herbie was my first big break. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh -huh. Herbie was my first big break, and then it only lasted a year because after that he decided he wanted to play with a, a whole new Brazilian band and a whole new thing. So, I was out of a job again. So then I was working. <clears throat> So I won't go through all the jobs that yeah. I did, but I, let's, let's so just go to, you want to go to Whitney. So Whitney. Where, now, were you with Whitney before Madonna? Yes. Okay, let's start with Whitney. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Nip happened is because a friend of mine named Wayne, uh, who went to Howard with me, was in, in Nip's band, in Whitney's band. And so he calls me one day and asked, you know. At w and sorry to cut you <clears> off. <throat> at, at what point in Whitney's career was she when you – came along and oh she, she was Whitney oh this, she was she, she was about to be Whitney this was a she had this, already killed it on the no, Arsenio she was Hall a, show and done all no, that no 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 oh, all right no no okay. no so this is before Tell the Super story, Bowl and all of that <laughs> so anyway long story short he was about to do he got signed him and his wife his wife is an amazing singer uh got a record deal and they were doing a record and so he couldn't really commit his time to all of Whitney's dates um, because he wanted to do the record with his wife. And so he asked me if I would come in and fill in. And I was like, yes, I needed a gig at that time. I was in the, I was in a really dark place in my life at that time. Mm -hmm. So I flew out to L.A. I came out. 
Uh, I really thought it was going to be like a walk-in type of situation, but it really wasn't. It was more like an audition type of situation. Oh. <laughs> and so there's other keyboard players, and I'm just like, okay, am I going to get this gig? So I go in. Oh, so it was you and other keyboard players. Me and about auditioning. 10 other keyboard oh, players. Yeah, but you, when you flew in, you thought you had the gig. Like you just thought I you thought were... it was a walk-in situation. I okay. don't know if I would had yeah. Yeah. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't think it was gonna be that. So maybe he told me or I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, No, you know. Yeah, so, just go fill in for just me. Go, man. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> long story short, um I mean I I do the best I could do. I get in and do what I do and then I didn't hear for a while. Who got the gig or not? Did you fly back to New York? No, but I want. I was on the way to. I'm sleeping on my man's couch. You mm -hmm. know, he got a wife. I think he had a new baby at the time. I think his son was was born by then. I think so. And so, I'm just like, dude, I can't sleep on your couch. Like, he go, oh, they gonna call, they gonna call. And then one one day they call. And he said, look out the window. It was a long stretch limousine. They take me over to West Hollywood at this place, um, which was a famous hotel at the time a popular hotel at the time had like a fireplace and a sunken living room and all that mm -hmm. and then i go i didn't meet nip at the at the audition so i go in and she shook my hand and hugged me and stuff to welcome you know i started rehearsing with her the next night we were on the tonight show with johnny carson oh wow the night the very next night and so i called my mom i was like D now but she did Arsenio before she did Johnny Carson, though, right? Well, I did Arsenio with her. Oh, okay. So she, I don't know how many times she did Arsenio show, mm -hmm. but I remember. So after that, I, uh, I called my mom and because my mom supported me, but she don't know this world. So you know, while I was playing with all these jazz people, that was cool, but that's not her thing. So she was just like, yeah, you know, yeah. But when she saw that, I was playing with Whitney. She's like, ah, oh, my son. My, he made it. <laughs> <laughs> At first, it's like, I wish he'd just get a job. Basically. And then Whitney, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe you could do this. How you do that? Mm -hmm. How you do that? No, my son. She's my biggest fan. Now. I got scrapbooks and all that stuff. I love her. Um, so, so from Nip, you know, we did everything. The Super Bowl when she sang the anthem. Now, that's... Let's let's discuss that that famous national that anthem famous that, national she, anthem. that she sung. This was yes. during what desert? It was desert storm. Desert storm. Yes. And I just remember, like the the national the two national anthems that resonate with me is uh, Marvin Gaye at of the All Star Game, of course, and Whitney Houston at that Super Bowl. Yes. And I'm you know I won't even get political about the national anthem and you know right right right. But right. man, she sang that, and I get chills every time. I hear her saying that, and then the, with the jets flying over the place. The whole performance was so amazing, and the thing about that is, because um, I was around for the recording of all of that, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I do believe a, a friend of mine named Jerry Peters, who's an amazing arranger, keyboard player, and all that, has been in the business a long time, arranged that. And so it was arranged so impeccably. Mm -hmm. First of all, then one, it was she just delivered at that time. Nip could sing the phone book and put it out and it would just be dope. Like <laughs> she could sing anything. Yeah. So her if voice she, is so powerful. It was man. so I'll it tell you a story like about that. Angelic, yeah. It was qu quite angelic is the word mm -hmm. is the word for me. And so, you know, when she sang it and we were all there supporting her and stuff, um, she just did such an amazing job of it. Let me like mm -hmm. during rehearsals. I mean, rehearsals is one thing and a live performance was another thing. Were you guys even blown away by the actual performance or you guys just knew she's about to murder this? We just knew she was about to murder it. It was, it was cause at that time, so by that time, like, so after we did the Tonight Show, then it was, it was towards the Christmas time. Um, we took a little break for all that and then we just started rehearsing and we just started working on all this stuff you guys were touring, right? We were about to tour. Okay. She was about to do her I'm Your Baby Tonight tour. And so um, we have been rehearsing that had chemistry and all that. So the Super Bowl was actually in the middle of our rehearsals. Mm. So we, she, she was just, you know. Hey, I got to do the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. But we were already down. Oh, that's we, Whitney? We, yeah, we, I got to yeah. do the Super Bowl. That's the Super Bowl. So we were down in Miami. Uh, we are re rehearsing so uh, in Florida. And so... 
Yeah, it was just you know we take a break that day, go to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. She goes, she she. But Nip could sing anything. I remember one night we were doing this song called In Return. We do you know liturgical and you know secular songs in the set because uh, she's from the church. So mm-hmm. and she had I never will forget this. She had this white dress on. She's just sitting on this stool in the thing, and we would play it every night. But this particular night, for some reason, she just just wanted to get more and I find myself crying. Like that's never happened to me on stage ever Now and since. This might be an unfair question to ask you but I'm sure I know the answer and I've never asked you this even privately. Is she the best singer you've ever worked for? Oh my gosh, that's- um, I'm talking I'm not most popular, not mo- most famous, but just pure her voice, man. Well- Cause I think, you know, before her voice started, you know, getting mm-hmm. a little damaged, I just, I just, her voice was almost perfect. To well, me. that's why I bring up that story because I look up the whole band, a couple of the cats. Was like, yeah, you guys, are, you guys play with her all the time. Every and you're night, crying. and we, and and I think she did it on purpose too. She was like, I'm gonna just, give it all, just so she could show us at any time she could do that. And and at that time, Nip was like, like she's like a big sister to me. I mean, her death really hit me hard, mm. really hurt me a lot, and so. Uh, even though I had lost touch with her and she'd been going through her challenges, but um, she still saved my life. So she still was like a big sister to when me. When you say she saved your, your life, do you mind going into? Um, I'm gonna save that okay. for a book. Okay, all right, that's fair. I just, 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 just sat, you know, suffice to say that before I got her gig, I was in a very dark place. Had mm-hmm. I not gotten her gig, I don't know no, what would happen. What I, I, would happen? Artist, I understand that. So, <laughs> Trust me, I understand yeah. That. So let's just we'll yeah. keep it that because that's a whole mm-hmm. like my family doesn't even know about this yet. Okay. So that yeah, <laughs> that's a whole sit down. I gotta yeah. I'm gonna get you to tell me off the air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah. So, um, but no. The, to answer your question, Nip is probably the most naturally gifted singer that I've ever worked with. Meaning that whatever she wanted to do at that time when she was in her heyday especially, Mm -hmm. she could do it with no problem. Like she, her range, her soul, her, uh, she could be- Stage presence. Just everything she wanted to do. And (laughs) the thing that I loved about Nip was that she was so regular off stage. Mm -hmm. So she's this elegant, Amazing person, with and this. I think that's what messed people up about Whitney because she came off with this real regal, okay, I will, I will, pristine. Regal is a great word, but I know? will tell you the story. So we were in Vegas one time. We were in the middle of the, the tour, and in Vegas, which I'm there now, I don't gamble. I don't do you know. I don't mm-hmm. go to strip clubs. Like I don't care about any of that stuff. So I'm bored. I'm just walking around there, and I come back into where we were staying, and I see Nip there with a bodyguard playing uh, blackjack. So I go over to her. I'm like, you winning? She's like, no, nah, come bring me some good luck. And then she plays a couple more hands. She wins. She's not. She's like, no, nah, I'm not winning. Let's go play something else. I was like, what you want to play? She's like, I don't know. I don't really know how to play none of this stuff. So I was like, all right, I'll teach you how to play roulette. So it's me and Nip sitting at the roulette table and bodyguard is over there just like watching us. So it's just like these rude dudes, they recognize her obviously, but mm-hmm. you know, these dudes are like kind of drunk, I guess, and it's just rude and just saying stuff to her and talking loud and whatever. And so we just are trying to have a good time. I'm trying to teach her how to put the chips on and all that. And she was like, man, I wish they would just shut up. Like, you know, mm-hmm. so she's just talking to me. So then finally the dude was just like, hey, Whitney, where are you playing at? Like, so she just was like, <laughs> she, she, Motherfucker, you see a moment. <laughs> she leans over to me. She said, "I'm playing at your motherfucking mother's house. You fucking redneck." Blah, blah, blah. She was just like, <laughs> "I was like," <laughs> and then she turns back to him. We're playing at the Thomas and Max Center. I was just like, I, I was so blown away by that. I by just was I was, the hoodness. I was, but I mean, I'm from that, so I'm just yeah. like I was laughing so hard. And so at the end of the night, I'm walking with her. I was like, I'm not gonna even call you Nip anymore. She's like, What you gonna call me? I said, What's the ghetto was name? I could. I started calling her Shaniqua Hightower. <laughs> Shaniqua Hightower. And she was. That was your nickname. That for was her? my nickname for her. She started <laughs> cracking up, and so every time we would be somewhere, 
Uh, and I just wanted to mess with her. I said, yo, Shanika. <laughs> like, don't let Shanika come out. Don't let Shanika. She would just laugh. But she was fun. We had balloon fights, like water balloon fights. Because you guys were all young and getting it and we making We were young money. and yeah. getting it and making money. I remember Nip was in, um, uh, we were in Florida, and she came to rehearsal, and she had a, this white on white, in white, uh, convertible Mercedes that didn't nobody have at the time. And the top down, she's like, burr, burr, burr. yeah, and just, just like, it's, it's funny you say that. I told the story when Chris Cuck, when Chris Tucker came to do Ruby Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he said a lot of nice things about me. And then um, right before he got off stage, I was like, yo, I got to tell this story about Chris. When Chris first kind of like, you know, was he was a millionaire, officially a millionaire. I remember being at the House of Blues at a concert. I don't know who it was saying. It might have been Nas or somebody like that. And Chris was there. And he saw me. He's like, what you doing, man? I said, nothing. He's like, you got to come across the street and see my car. His car was parked at the comedy store. So we went over there. It was a white on white on white wow. Bentley. Wow. And then he's like, you like my car, man? I said, man, Chris. I said, congratulate. This night's like, yeah, man. This is white. <laughs> It's so white, I dropped my joint in here and I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, it was real. He had a joint. That, the car was so white, you couldn't see where the joint was. Oh he had dropped God. it in the car. You could smell it, but you couldn't find the joint. I know. That's that's how white his car, it was white on white. And he was like, and then it was funny. He was like, I remember that. I was like, yeah. So it was like one of those moments so where he got to share like, yo, dude, look at what I'm able to buy because I used to drive no, around when he, he didn't have a car. And that's, but that's, I'm glad he shared that with yeah. you too. And Nip was the same way. She was so generous, man. Like she, you know, we rode with her and hung with her and stayed with her and been to her house. And, you know, a lot of artists are not like that. They don't mm. invite you into their space like that. Yeah. And, and Nip was like that. So how did you transition to working with Madonna? Like when you're a music director, I'm mm -hmm. sure your name floats around just like for comedians. Your name probably floats around for different gigs and stuff like that. How yeah. did the Madonna thing come It about? does. So Madonna, <laughs> Madonna came out. So I, I remember this. I was actually out with Rochelle Farrell. And then I got a call to say that Madonna was looking for musicians in New York specifically to play at on Saturday Night Live with her. She was gonna be on Saturday Night Live. I think she was hosting and she had two, uh, no, she wasn't hosting, it was Harvey Keitel was hosting, but she was the musical guest. Okay. And so I go down to um, to where they told me to go down to, which was her place in Central Park Avenue. Uh, and I get there and I'm thinking I'm gonna meet Madonna or a talk and the, the doorman is just like, yeah, you got your photo? Like, <laughs> photo? Yeah, this is photos. She want photos. I'm like, I don't have no photo. I was like, I thought this was like a meet or audition or coming to meet me or whatever. Anyway, so. <laughs> what would have, why did she, she just want to know what she, I have no, dude. That's so funny for but, a musician I mean, at to that have time, a photo. I, I, and at that time I had a reputation, but I was, you know, I didn't have, so I didn't get the gig. And so, you know, it was like a few days later they called me and they said, can you come down? I was like, what happened? It's like, the guy, I guess the guy who had the photo couldn't play. <laughs> so I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Uh, so I go down and um, I get I get with the band and some of the guys I knew and some of the guys I didn't, but I, I wasn't a music director at that time. And um, I just get in and start playing, but it's funny. It's so funny and I don't know if I should tell the story, but I'm gonna tell it. Tell, tell it. it. <laughs> yeah. Please tell the story. So. The people that were handling her at the time, it wasn't, I don't, I wouldn't specifically say it was the management, but whoever was handling this particular gig took us in a room, all the musicians and said, okay, so when Madonna gets here, the whole speech of, you know, don't engage with her unless she engages with you, like almost like don't look her in the eye and all oh, this. When you hear shit like, like that. Man, yeah. dude. People so, don't even realize how common that is sometimes in this business. It's so common. Yeah. And so Don't shake the, his hand. Yeah, don't do this. Dude, don't do, and yeah. so what, what was like, funny. Like, motherfucker a human being? Exactly. And right, what was so funny about it was the musicians in the band. So the drummer had just played with Sting uh, and this band called Weather Report. And he had been out with all these people. The bass player was out. Weather, like They were famous musicians. There were famous musicians in this band. Yeah. Like this so, ain't no This is yeah. No you know, I was just out with Whitney Houston. Yeah. Like what are you talking about? We the A team, yo. Well, we are the A team. <laughs> we, yeah. we I know we just meeting her, we just working with her, but dude, like so <laughs> when she comes in, the first like she couldn't even get her foot in the door. The bass player's got like, yo, Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> just broke the rules. Just broke the whole thing. <laughs> and so she's coming in with a little crew and 
you know, she's coming in. And so we we laughing at, at Victor, what's his name? Victor uh-huh. Bailey. He, he passed away. God rest his soul, too. And so he's he's just talking to her. And then so then me and the drummer just start talking to her. Like the management, you know, they're over at the side. Like, oh, my God, we ain't even played a note yet mm-hmm. for her. And so then the bass, then Madonna and, and, and Victor just go back and forth with, with it. Like then she's like, "You sure were talking about shit?" Like like, fuck you. you know, like he's going back like oh, that. Going back and forth talking and shit. Me, so me and the drummer are just like, "Oh my god, we, <laughs> we lost this." Gig. And so and so and then she's like, "Well, you guys sure talk so much. Can you play?" I said, "What you want to hear?" She said, "We it was two songs we were doing for that show. It was called one was called Fever and one was called Bad Girl." And so she said, "Let me hear Fever." I said, count it off. <laughs> so she counts it off. We play it, and I see her in the chair. She's just like. She's grooving. She's grooving hard. She's smiling. And so then after we finish that, I say, you want to sing with us? She said, give me a mic. We hand her a mic. She starts singing. The long story short, at the end of that rehearsal, she's hugging us, kissing us. These guys are great. I don't know where you found them, but they're amazing, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And I'm looking at them like. Y'all told us not to speak to her. Like, yeah, they it was don't so know. crazy. They're just doing what they think. They, you know it's what I mean? so ridiculous. And so we do the show, um, and that's you can see us. You know, all at the end where we everybody's waving. Like we just bogarted our way onto the stage. We wave. We all behind. Chris Rock's there. Uh, Farley is there. Uh, uh, all the all the characters that were there, and we all wave. You can see that on YouTube somewhere. Um, maybe. I'm, I'm gonna have to go look up yeah. that episode, Chris. Yeah, I'll that send, up send some of these photos. I think I have some. And yeah. so, the, her manager at the time, whose name is Freddie Demand, he, he pulls Madonna would like to see you in her dressing room. We go to the dressing room, and um, I'm thinking that's it. Like, okay, we're done. Yeah, good gig. Yeah, good High gig. Five. How, yeah, <laughs> and so that's what I'm thinking. And then this was right around the time her book, uh, that sex book that she had, that was really popular, came out. You remember? You know the name of her, Chris? Was uh, it? Uh, erotica or something I forget but it was a very popular book but we, we had to get probably a photo of that and so look it up Chris um, I thought it was just like she was going to give us that or some of the guys <laughs> she's going to sign the book yeah so, <laughs> I didn't know what it was so she was like that was a great show and blah 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 and she's like she said what you guys doing for the summer I said going on tour with you and she was like you're funny I was like but am I right she was like I'm offering it to y'all and I was like Yes. Wow. And so that's how that started. That's how that and started. And how long did you tour with Madonna? Well, we 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 flew out to um, L.A. and we started. So the first tour I did with her is called The Girly Show. And so we did that tour for however long it was. We went to Australia. We went to a bunch of places. Uh, Brazil. I remember. Ooh, Brazil. Brazil was, Brazil was crazy. I, I so imagine. It was 3,000 people outside that hotel room, uh, the hotel, before we got there. Wow, we had to run through the crowd to get in. It was Brazil was crazy. We needed like commando guards to take us to the gig. By the time we got to Rio, Sao Paulo, we we played first, but Rio was like because this Madonna was Madonna at that time too. She mm-hmm. was big. Yeah, um, you know, the Rio gig was almost two hundred thousand people. It was a hundred and something thousand people. They told us close to two hundred thousand people. Wow, at, at the soccer stadium. So and, that was the first tour you did. With so her. that was the first tour, and then after that, she called me. And uh, usually they have people who they call you say, you know, I have Madonna for you. I have Michael for you. I have somebody for yeah. you. I, mean, I pick up my phone. It's just Madonna. I'm like, Madonna? Hey. <laughs> she's, <laughs> like, she's like, yeah, I want to ask you something. I'm like, what? She said, you're not going to do it. I was like, you didn't even ask me yet. Mm-hmm. And then, then she says, well, I want you to be my music director. And I'm, I'm silly. So I go, yeah, let me think about that. I'll call you back. Hilar- had you been a musical director up until this point? Well, yes, I had been a music director, but I hadn't been a music director for a huge pop star like that. Uh, so I was okay. a music director. So when I was coming up, you know, after my Herbie Mann days, I was music director for like Angela Bofill and people like that. And then I used to do a show that I was a music director for where it was just one band and all these stars playing. You tour out. So I started cutting my teeth as being a music director in the, in the industry mm. but i just hadn't done um somebody huge somebody like, huge like madonna yeah and so um she asked me so then i asked her i was like well why she was like well you don't take shit from me and you tell me what i i don't necessarily want to hear all the time but i need to hear it now let's let's pause for a second now me and you talk about this because you know i work with comedians and writing help with their act and i think what she saw in you, that's something that's very important that a lot of comedians don't, um, that don't 
don't realize is important is the ability for you to be perfectly honest with an artist and that's how you get the best out of them like you don't have to be able to agree but you should be able to be honest with them so you can get the best out of them and that's what she saw in you somebody who's going to say no banana it needs to go like this it needs to sound like that and that's a hard thing to say to your boss you know? Well, and what you said earlier was like, aren't they human beings? So you should at least be able to give your opinion. That doesn't even mean you're right. Yeah. So I, a, at, come on, man. So I That's should the just, thing. I should at least be able to say, and if, if I'm not right, then maybe I'm learning something. Mm-hmm. But if you hire me to handle your music. Got to be honest, man. I got to give you my opinion on what I think it is. And I hate whack stuff. Like, yeah, well, there's a lot of yes men in this business. And I know on, on the, the comedy side, especially because there's a stigma of, having quote unquote writers to help you with your act. But I always say this, if Richard Pryor had writers, then everybody can have writers because right. he's the greatest of all time. Right. And what's funny is that every comedian, whether they want to admit it or not, all the great ones, they have somebody that they write and collaborate with. That, exactly. All of them. Exactly. Let me say that clear. All of them. Because I them. know. All of them. All of them. Everybody has somebody all of collab- them. And it doesn't mean that there's somebody sitting down there writing your act. That's not it. But... You know, this art form is tough, especially the more popular you get, the busier you get. Yes. And then sometimes comedically yes. it's just good to have somebody to bounce ideas off and it's all a part of the creative process. But if you can't be honest within that, I always tell everybody that I work with, I'm never going to lie to you. Doesn't mean that I'm right, right, but based on what my knowledge and what I probably learned from them because they're great at what they do absolutely then I'm able to process that and to be able to be of value to them going, yo, dude. You need to say this joke right here at this time, or you need to add this line here, or you need to go on this, whatever it is. And then it, nine times out of 10, it works, and I'm right. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. I mean, but go ahead. No, but, but that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. What, what also, because first of all, you're right, I'm, there are a lot of yes men. I've never been a sycophant in my life. Yeah. And I just can't, I just was not raised that way. Mm. And I just can't do it. Yeah, I so can't either, man. I probably could be further along in this yeah. business if it's, I did It's sad that. because they, there's a lot of people that are hired and you see some artists not doing as well because the people around them feel like they can't be honest and tell them so there's so much mediocrity in what they do. It actually damages their brand. Absolutely. It's like, why not, you know, even if, it, if you're so sensitive, why not have your feelings hurt for two minutes with somebody who loves and cares about you than doing bad work to a mass audience. But you know what the problem is? Because when you have all those other satellites orbiting around them, you don't have that direct access all the time. So even if the artist is in a moment of, of, of low self-esteem and you come in and give it back to them, mm-hmm. once them. you leave, the satellites are still orbiting yeah. saying this. Yeah, and so then they there, come yeah. back down. Yeah. And so that's the problem. You need a strong artist to be able to take you know, the direction and the, the dictation and, and things that you give them and to be able to say, you know, to be able to surrender the fact that, you know, my thing with artists is that if you know that I'm the music director, the fans will know. I'm not out there. That's not my agenda. If they know, they know. That's what I do for a living. That, yeah. That's cool. It does not mean that you didn't do it. It yeah. does not mean that you are not still the artist. It still comes from it you. It still comes from you. Yeah. You wrote the song. Mm-hmm. I'm just directing it in a way that it translates better to the audience yeah, live. Because you're taking what's on an <clears> album <throat> and you're bringing that to a public live. <laughs> People can listen to the record at home. That's what I say to my artists all the time. If you want the record, then play the record. You don't need me. Yeah. But if you want to move, as I always say, if you want to move souls, then that's what you. That's what I'm there for. I know how to move the air around your music, so you get the reciprocity back from the artist. Yeah. That I mean, from the audience. audience. And yeah. so it's, you give, and they give back. And the more you get that loop going, then you have a good time. Mm-hmm. And they want to come back because it's an emotional experience. Yeah. I told you Aretha Franklin was my first memory of music. I was so enthralled by the feeling of that that I did it for the rest of my life. Yeah. And so that kind of communal experience. That's crazy you say that. Yes. Because I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about um, Eddie Murphy when I saw Eddie Murphy delirious. And I remember uh, my parents went to church. I don't know how I convinced them to get HBO, um, <laughs> but we had HBO and I'm, all, I'm, and I'm on the bed. Yes. And I'm watching Eddie Murphy show. delirious and I'm laughing so hard that I'm crying laughing. Yeah. And I remember a moment where I'm taking a deep breath 
And I remember looking at Eddie Murphy and I said to myself in that moment, man, I want to make people feel how yes. he's making me feel right now. Yes. So when you say that, I clearly understand that. And I just remember yes. just, I, at that point, I don't think I had ever laughed that hard before. And mm. I was just amazed by Eddie Murphy. Now, Richard Pryor, full disclosure, is my favorite comedian of all time. He's amazing. But there was something about Eddie Murphy that made it real and accessible to me because Richard was from another, right? like, you know, he was for our parents. And, right. and even though I was a kid, Eddie was still like, who like who is this guy? Is, I remember and he's talking I, about I my life and the ice cream truck and uh, all just the these whole cookout thing and, alone. And his impressions, I was yes. just blown away, and I just remember my stomach hurting from laughing so hard. And the thing that's important that you said is that he made you feel like you could do that. Yeah, you know, it was the thing about MJ was that I'm from South of Chicago, as I keep saying, and they were from Gary, Indiana, which is not that far from mm -hmm. where I grew up. Yeah, that's where Buddy Lewis is from. Oh, yeah. And Buddy Lewis, which is ironic, too. My closest friends, you and Buddy. Buddy went to Howard on a swimming scholarship. Is that right? Yeah, Buddy was a swimmer. You guys got to talk, oh, about, that yeah, talk but, about that. Oh, we definitely got to talk about that. Buddy's a Howard alum. Okay. And um, yeah, a he lot of us. Yeah, dude. But, but go us. ahead. You're saying no, 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 but so, Michael's from Gary. But and them, so, I mean, they had cartoons that we watched when we were kids. Like, nobody that was that famous at that time looked like me. Mm -hmm. So when I saw MJ, and, I, and that's... At the Jackson Five was actually the first concert I ever saw. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. First concert. Who I took ever you saw. to? Yeah, your my parents mom, or your mom? My mom, yeah. my mom and my my godmom. And so we all went, and you know, and we had to sit through other acts. I remember this other act called One uh, Undisputed Truth was the name of the group, and they had a song called Smiling Faces. You've heard of Undisputed Truth? I haven't, Chris. <laughs> they have a song called Smiling Faces, which is a famous song. And then, wait, wait, I think I know that song, Smiling, smiling Faces. Yeah. Sometimes tell a lot. Chris yeah. is just smiling. You ain't got your mic over there, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> Go, Chris. That's what's up. <laughs> and so we had to see through that, and I think another act, then the Jackson 5 finally came on. And when they came on, I was, we, you know, everybody, I mean, we were way, way up mm -hmm. the nosebleeds, but. Um, I just remember and just being just transfixed on Michael because he was so amazing. Um, but just the whole band, just but I just to see young black boys, yeah, on oh, a that's stage. Crazy. Yeah, they were kids. So when I was going home, they were kids, man. Yeah. And so when I was, you know, we were driving home, I was just like still moved by the concert and I said to myself, I was like, I want to be Michael Jackson's friend. <laughs> and not only was I his friend. Uh, for the brief time that we worked together, um, he entrusted me with his whole musical catalog. Catalog. So let's, since you brought Mike up, how did that transpire? How did you get the Michael Jackson gig? Now you've worked with Whitney Houston, you've worked with all these great artists, you've worked with Madonna, and you have a reputation, you know, amongst the industry. People know that you're dope. How do you get from there to the greatest entertainer? Of all so, time, what I always which is not up for debate, <clears throat> by the way. That's not up for. That's <laughs> not. It's not up for debate. So what I what I tell people all the time, I got to become Michael Jackson's music director because I played at Terminal D, and I played at all these other little clubs, and I played at the New Year's Eve with three drunk people left. I got to be his music director because I came through all of that and every experience that I ever had. Uh, made it possible, the conditions existed for me to be able to step into that role. You ha Had I not done everything else that I did before mm. Michael Jackson, yeah. I would not have become Michael Jackson. Isn't it, isn't it great to get to that moment where sometimes, and I'm sure Chris and even Johnny can relate to this, sometimes as a comic you're doing gigs, you're like, why the hell am I here? Why yeah. the hell am I doing these yes. gigs? sick of this i don't want to be like i hate this gig i don't feel like doing this gig. Yes. i don't feel like driving here i don't i know it's gonna be a shitty gig and then you get to a point in your life you go oh that's why i had to go i did that when i was at howard's like what, i'm still waiting for my moment before i can <laughs> go back and go that's why i did all that because no. i hate this shit right now no but, and it, it's true like yeah. i remember how i would having to take a conducting class and i was like why we gotta do this and i ain't gonna never do this and now that's what i do i conduct symphonies and stuff so, so how did, how did so, the michael jackson so mj so finally however my name got into the the mix the ethos of of 
they were he looking. Said, he said ethos. They were looking for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I went to Howard H. U. So uh, <laughs> big college words. That's a college word that they pay scholarship for. But so, um, so, uh, so they were looking for music directors. So his other music, his other music director, for some reason, they didn't want to have him back for whatever reason. I'm, it's not. It's not a diss to him. It's for whatever reason because he's been there for. He, he had played on all the records. Like, he was somebody that I was listening to growing up, mm. you know. So he, he's he been there. He's fabulous. He's amazing. It was, it's not a diss to him. Um, but there, you know, so there were other names that they were looking at. And so mine got there, and um, we, we worked in a way. So I got in to see uh, Kenny Ortega, who's the director. So oh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I go in, and I have a meeting with Kenny, and Kenny just – really is enamored and, and loves me and he goes you know what you need to see michael tonight can you come back tonight Why? <laughs> and so what was that moment when he said that that moment was just the like, stomach drop like butterflies like oh no you know what it was it wasn't butterflies at all it was more like okay i'm on the next step mm. um because at that at that time especially after madonna so because you know after madonna i went to j-lo and so you know, this J-Lo, it, it, and it wasn't the first time I worked with Michael. The first time I worked with Michael was at the um, 30th anniversary concert that they did at Madison Square Garden right before 911 happened. Mm. So we had done shows, and I played with Michael, his brothers, and everybody on the show, and that means Luther. Did you guys uh, have a connection back then, or it was kind of just no, like you it, were just it was a part just, of the band? I was just part of the band. It was because mm -hmm. his music director was there at the time, and then his other music director, uh, Brad, was there at the time. And, you know, so I was just like a third keyboard player back then. They just asked me to play additional parts mm -hmm. on the thing. I was slated to play with everybody else. Then they asked me to play with Michael. So mm -hmm. that was that was how that happened. And so, but I mean, he was cool. I'm in rehearsal. I'm talking to him, and mm -hmm. you know, we got along and all that. And so, and then I played on some records. Michael was famous for recording and recording and recording and recording. So I played on a lot of recordings that didn't make records, but he would track like eighty to hundred songs. Wow! Each album cycle to just. Oh, I had no idea. Oh yeah, there's tons of records out that people so play. So there's on there's Michael Jackson music out that no one has ever heard. This is true. I wonder who has access to that. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's for the book yeah <laughs> there's so so fast forward to that so he um, said you got to see him you got to see him tonight. tonight and so i said to kenny i said okay that's great can we have keyboards in the room can i have a keyboard in the room a keyboard that's like can we can you put a keyboard because he just wanted you to meet mike he just wanted me to meet mike one-on-one -on -one. you're and like I, no i need a keyboard in the room. i wanted a keyboard in the room okay and so I come in and I'm I'm playing already, and then they bring Michael in, and he hears me playing, and Michael comes in. And I see this was right around the time when the rumors were like he's in a wheelchair and he can't do all that stuff. I'm not knowing what to expect. <laughs> you think I'm playing come in with a mask and a wheelchair. Mike, man, come on, <laughs> Mike. Mike comes in and he's like he's doing his MJ stuff to what I'm playing, and oh, he comes in, he's, he's dancing, he's so dancing he's already, and so I'm just like, okay, don't you know, don't believe everything you read, and so. I, you know, I stand up and I embrace him, he embraced me, and we, he, hi, and I hadn't seen him, I reminded him of the, the 911 concert, which was a trip, because that literally, you know, after we did the last show in New York, and then I had to fly back to LA to start rehearsals with J-Lo to do her Puerto Rico special, mm -hmm. and I was flying. Oh, is that, that's what she did on HBO, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and we were flying, I left at eight in the morning, I still have the ticket, 9-11, mm -hmm. eight, eight in the morning, and I was, really tired and I was asleep and then I, the food was there I was like man let me get something to eat because when I land I got to go right to rehearsal and they brought the food out and then uh, I'm not forgetting my story and so then they snatched the food away I'm like huh and the captain comes on and says we have to make an emergency landing I'm just like what's going on and we land in like Cincinnati or something somewhere and I get there I had, still had no idea what happened Mm. And I see all this chaos. I see people crying. I can't get out on a cell phone. I can't get. And they told us what happened, but we didn't see it. So it took me two hours to get my bags to another hour to get in a line to find a hotel. Couldn't find one in Cincinnati. Had to go to Kentucky or something. Finally get to the room, turn on CNN and see what happened. And I'm just like, huh? We were just up there. Wow. I was just up there. So the rest of that definitely will be in the book. But that was a long, that was like, so. We didn't talk about that when I saw Michael, but I told him that's the last time I saw him. 
Um, and then so then he was started telling me what he was looking for in a music director and all that. And then me being me, I started telling him what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure like, Mike would. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, but yo, this is what I'm expected to like. Yeah, that's how I am, dude. Like I'm, I'm gonna let you know off top. Exactly, we're all human, going. man. But in the middle of just me and him talking and Kenny's there you saying things and um and it's just me and Michael and Kenny and I think Kenny's assistant was there and um I started playing stuff so I said like, NJ sing this and I start like one thing I played was can't help it because I love that song can't help, can't help it, it. Can't yes help yes it. I started playing that and he starts singing it yeah and then yeah I think he said Kenny you don't know that shame on you you don't know that one and so Every now and then I just sneak in and just start playing stuff because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get a rapport going and mm -hmm. let him know that I know his catalog and I know his range. I started playing Smile. He loves that song, the, the Charlie Chap Chaplin song. Mm. And he loves that. And he starts singing and he got up and he started doing his little Michael Michaelisms. He starts performing in the room. Start performing. We did like a show for like a half hour. <laughs> <You> <laughs> like 20 keep... minutes. Like just, I just kept hitting yeah. him with stuff. Hey, how about, and then you just start I just playing. kept hitting him with stuff because that's what I wanted. So then we get up finally and because it's a couple of the cats waiting to come in. <laughs> uh, this guy's waiting to audition? After they hearing all this. <laughs> they hearing You're all playing, this. You're playing, he's I'm singing, y'all They didn't ask for a keyboard though. They just supposed to meet him. Mm. I'm the only one who asked for that. Wow. And so, for, to my knowledge. And so, after that, you know, he's like, thank you. And I was like, can I get the set list? <laughs> he was like, he was looking at me like, you're funny. Like, mm -hmm. like I, was, I was being That's silly. That's how bold you are. But though. I was being silly. And so, I left and, you know, I got home and, you know, it wasn't a good hour or so. They called me and was just like, like we're really supposed to do this with you. So that's how that happened. Wow. You got the call within an hour. Um, it might not have been that quick. Yeah, but, but, but after he probably met those other people. Yeah. Then, it wow. was fairly quick. It is. It, uh, there's a saying, um, and you know, uh, for you guys know, me and Mike met on the George Lopez show because you were George Lopez's uh, musical director, band mm -hmm. leader on his talk show. And George used to have this, even at his, uh, some of the shows, he used to have this piece of tape um, on the ground that he, he used to rub his foot across, and it's, it was in Latin, but it's yes, like fortune yes. favors the bold. the bold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just some of your stories is being that bold in those moments, mm. you know, kind of propelled you to some of these opportunities that were placed in front of you. Like, hey, we going on, what you told Madonna, we going on, I'm going on tour with you. Yeah. You know, can yeah. I get that music catalog to Mike? Like, that's a very bold, confident thing to say. And um, it's a lesson. It's like, when you believe in yourself, you know, you have to speak up. And a lot of times I think, if I'm being honest with myself and my career, sometimes I stay silent. Well, and, and it's, it's true. Clo like, you know. Closed mouth. Closed mouth don't get fed like every yeah. black grandmama say. You, yeah. know, you know. But I just, it was, it's hard for me because I was just raised, keep, you know, I had a Haitian well, father. You know, keep your mouth shut. Don't ask for nothing. You can do it yourself. You, know. <laughs> you ain't getting nothing. Like, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> so. No, no, no. I, I understand it. And like I said earlier, I was, I was such a shy and introverted kid. And mm -hmm. so I would just... You know, like a lot of the loud kids that were in my neighborhood, you know, some of the kids, they, like I said, we had to press on, you know, iron on T-shirts. And some of them had on tailor-made things that they par their parents have made or whomever. Yeah. And they had the, you know, the best equipment and all that, but they couldn't play. <laughs> so mm. I was just like, you talking loud, but you ain't saying nothing, as James Brown said. Yeah. So th that was my thing. I would always want the music to say something, but... You, you and I talk about this a lot because we can't be that way in this business. You have to learn how to play the game, which is actually something that George Lopez said to me one day mm -hmm. after a show. And we were talking about certain things and and, and he said, you know, this, this is a game, you gotta know how to play it. You gotta learn how to play it. And um, and he's right. So being bold in those those instances is actually true. Not being arrogant, not being, you know, you know, an asshole, just, just being, confident that you can do the job mm -hmm. and so I, i'm still actually learning how to, how to yeah, do, so do that yeah. but i have enough reputation and enough you know work yeah to show people what i can do so obviously you get the gig with michael uh you guys start the process the mm -hmm. rehearsal all of this was being documented which ended up being the movie this is it and um, you've shared this story before, and I know his, the anniversary of his passing was um, 
Was just June twenty fifth. June twenty fifth. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what always struck me is what you tell me is uh, the last thing you you said to him. Yeah. So this particular night, I remember during the day, he and Kenny and Travis. Travis was the choreographer, uh, and I, and we were looking at you know because there were a lot of things going on on that tour. There were films that he reshot that I was supposed to score. There was 3D things that were happening. There were prop things that were happening. There was just like a whole lot of things happening. And they had to come through us. You know, the people who were building these things and the people who were, you know, creating these things had to get, you know, our approval on the progress. And so he and I and Kenny and Travis were sitting down at a table and we were uh, just looking at all these things that they, they would just come and it was a whole agenda. And I remember they brought Michael food and um, he was sitting right next to me. And I, I remember this and I don't know why I remember this. <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember that they didn't bring him utensils and he didn't wait. He just started eating with his fingers, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And I just found that fascinating. I was just like, <laughs> and then as they were talking to him, he would lean over. He and I became, you know, really silly because I'm silly and he was silly. And we would just talk about crazy stuff all the time and so while they're telling him stuff he was saying to me he was like yeah that's nice he said what's your favorite three stooges yeah i think i like that and i was like oh my god <laughs> just out of the blue huh? what's your favorite three stooges i was like i like curly he's like yeah yeah no i don't i want that yeah i like mo <laughs> and it's just so a, he, it was he's just a, working and having these side conversations just the, the most random time. thing but it was so it was just so me and him mm-hmm. on that, on that particular. And so this is when we finally got to the stage, and we got to the stage. And this particular night, you know, we started playing whatever we were playing. I don't remember, but I do remember that he was killing it so much to the point where you could see the the vibe on him and the glow on him. Even my band members were coming to like, "Yo, what's up with MJ tonight?" Like it was good. Like at one point, he looked back at me as if to say, "Yeah, I'm Michael Jackson." <laughs> I, I got this like yeah, y'all, y'all, yeah. everybody sweating me but yeah I yeah. got this like yeah. but and we we felt it that tour was going to be it was going to be humongous. phenomenal it was going to be humongous and but it was going to be phenomenal yeah and so but that particular night I was tired and when we parked at the Staples Center he had you know there were three SUVs for him um for all his detail his security and all that and then my car was there but it was blocked so I couldn't really get out so I'm sitting in my car waiting, and he finally gets there, and he's about to leave. And I was like, dude, I'm, I'm tired, man. And he's laughing and stuff. And he said, um, I said, man, you looked amazing tonight. Thank you. The band sounds great. Blah, blah, blah. We're doing. I said, what time are you coming in tomorrow? I said, I'll probably come in at like 2 with Travis and dance and then do everything like we did today. Then I'll probably come in there with you late like we did. And I was like, okay, whatever. And he said, you know, we say this every night. God bless you. God bless you. I love you. I love you. And then um, he was like, I'll see you tomorrow. And that was it. I never saw him. Wow. I never saw him. Wow, man. It's just been, you've had an amazing journey in this business. Um, we done? You wrapping me up? No, I'm not. not you doing we, this? We, you we, giving we, me the red light? Like, not, like at Laugh Factors? It's, it's what, at Ruby Tuesday? <laughs> that you do every Tuesday? Yeah. Every Tuesday, 9 30. You, you come a lot to the show, man. I appreciate your support. I, I love it. You, man, you come through, you bring people through, and it's always dope. But um, there's a you know two two things I want to talk about before I let you go. One was the moment that I think people get misconstrued, and this is it when you got you and Michael are, are kind of going back and forth about a certain oh. song. Could you, <laughs> you know how many people come up to me about that? I know, that? I know, it, it's so crazy because I think it's, it's they don't. I wanted to talk about the relationship and the depth of it because I think it's a little out of context when you see it. Well, well, what well. First of all, what happens is once the cameras were there and they were there every day, you don't really pay attention to them. Mm-hmm. So the cameras are in our face, obviously, because yeah. you see the footage, but we never really saw them. Mm-hmm. Like, we never really paid attention to them. you're just used to them. They're just We're there. used to them, one. They were good at, at their jobs, too, but we were just working. Mm-hmm. Like, my whole sole focus at that time was, like, I'm Michael Jackson, music director. Like, I got to make this happen. Yes. This is, has to happen. Everybody paying attention to this, like, I, this is falling on me. I got to, you know, not just me. Like, Kenny is there doing an amazing job. Kenny is an amazing director. Mm-hmm. Uh, Travis was doing his thing. He was an amazing choreographer, especially a choreographer, especially for him, mm-hmm. for MJ. So if we were a team. It was, you know, it wasn't just me, but musically, yeah. it was only me. Yeah. 
as far as so the what, direction. what was the song again so, that, um, he's like I, like the album <laughs> the, way, the way you make me feel well first well before that <laughs> Before that happened, though, I, I like the album. I, I, I had spoken to MJ throughout the day, like, because he had promised he hadn't been in with the band for a minute, mm -hmm. if at all, at that time. I can't remember had he sang with us or not, but it was getting to the point where I can only rehearse the band so, so much. much until you come in. Then we can figure out what else I need to do. Then you leave. Mm -hmm. Then I'm good. Yeah. But I need you now. Yeah. I can't guess. I need you now. I'll be in there. I'll be in there. And it was like one hour, two hours. MJ, when you come in, I'll be in there, be in there. Three, four, five. It was like six hours, something like that. And then he coming in. They had prepped the room, looked a certain way and all that. And then he comes in, however many hours late. And then trying to regulate. <laughs> now I know you the boss. I know you the boss. I know you Michael Jackson. I know I'm working for you. Mm -hmm. I know under. I understand all this. I know. I know where I am. Yeah, but you're a little annoyed that you've I'm been annoyed, there. dude. I'm like, dude, come on, man. Like, yeah. really? Because, like I said, we've been saying throughout this whole podcast is that I'm going to be who I am. Mm -hmm. That's just how I, I'm not going to be disrespectful because I'm yeah. not that. Yes, but I'm. I'm not going to let you. Know, I'm not going to act like I'm not annoyed if I am. Yeah. So I was annoyed. Mm -hmm. And so um, he felt it, and but he's still trying to be him. Mm -hmm. And so we just going back and forth. We're going back and forth. And so, you know, like, dude, I know what your record is. And, you know, I'm like, I like the record. I was like, yeah, we can do the record. They can listen to the record at home. You want something new, let's do that. Mm -hmm. This is what you've been telling me, so yeah. that's what we're trying to do. But so that's what that was. But so I finally broke it when I told him, and this is the famous line that everybody comes up to me about, about put a little more booty on it. We need you to do the sound check because can't nobody hear what you need to hear. Some people might not want to have that I bass. Want, like, I wanted the way I wrote it. I mean, like the audience hears it. Wait, so wherever the record's doing, that's how I want to sound. Yeah, so. that's, that's what it's going to sound like. But you got to get closer to what you want then if you want to hear a little more booty on something something else you know what i mean that's mm -hmm. kind of, that, mm -hmm. only you can say that you know what i'm saying a little more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's funny and i was i didn't even that's just how i talk that's how musicians talk mm -hmm. we talk in descriptive terms not necessarily musical terms all the time exactly. i mean i can speak to you in musically we do the same thing and diminuendo yeah. and crescendo and mm -hmm. whatever else i need to do when i speak to orchestras and but even when i speak to orchestras i speak in descriptive terms because you can get the feeling better yeah than a, a technical term so when i said that i was just like he just started cracking up mm -hmm. he just started laughing because whatever what you don't see is after that scene him coming over to me going okay i hear you or i feel you we hug him and just like okay i understand i'll be in here more or whatever whatever he said to me yeah the cameras weren't rolling in mm -hmm. and so this is this but this is just what or we, they didn't put it in the documentary or they didn't put it in you yeah. know i mean i'm part i'm one of the producers on it so yeah. i don't know i don't know if i ever saw them the shoot footage. the footage after yeah. it. it it's not it may exist. I don't know if I ever saw it. Yeah. So uh, regardless, is you don't see that part of it, mm -hmm. and so that's the back and forth he and I had. You know, and this is this is what I will tell. And no cameras were, were rolling. So what I would do every day is we rehearse the band, and we had multi track, and we you know recorded just like we were recording a record or something. And if he didn't come in with the day, I would have it put on his iPod. That's how long ago that was. iPod and some headphones. I got them to get iPod and headphones. iPod, jeez. And headphones. Isn't it crazy that yeah. now iPod sounds old? This iPod you sounds know? old. <laughs> and that she, iPhone might sound old next week. Exactly. So I, I would send that, what the band did, so he could listen to it while they're driving him home. And um, one day he came in and he said, um, Mr. Bearden, Mr. Jackson would like to see you. And I always tell when Michael was there because he had this scent that he wore. And so even if I didn't see him. You could smell him. Oh, my God. You could like But it was great. It was like it was amazing. So um, I said, oh, yeah, Michael's here. So I go into his room. I said, what's up, MJ? He said, you know, how's band doing? Blah, blah, blah. I, said, I said, yeah, you want to hear? We were going to work on a new arrangement of something. I said, you want to hear? He said, nope. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> nope. I said, we not going to work on it today? So, yeah, we're going to work on it. I said, you don't want to hear it, MJ? He said, no. Now I'm getting nervous because I'm like, okay, what's wrong? Like, why you have me come in here? He said, I said, well, you mind if I ask why you don't want to work on it? You don't want to hear it? He says, because you got me now. I trust you. 
Mm. And I'm sitting there just like. That's a moment, man. That's a moment. And I was like, where's well, the cameras with that? He's yeah. like, I, tr I trust you. You got me now. You That's got a moment. Me. Well, it just, it just yeah. again, goes back to, you know, what your gift is and your, your, your ability to, you know, communicate with these artists on a level where they have that trust in you. Mm. Because it's hard, man. Like, you know, I'm an artist. As a comedian, it's hard sometimes when it's you pour everything into something and you want it to be protected. And me being a comedian, I understand the insecurities that a comedian might feel, especially in their own work. Like, we, we exude nothing but confidence on stage, but in the process of putting everything together, that's when you go through the anxiousness, of, is this joke going to work? Is this joke, why isn't this hitting the way that it should hit and all these things? So when you're somebody helping somebody along with that process, you know, a big part of it is making them feel secure, like, yo, Russ, I'm telling you, this yeah. is going to kill. Yeah. Trust me, I'm telling you. Yes. If, if you say this line right here like this, with that inflection that you do, or that look, is I'm telling you, you're going to get an applause break, it's going to smack, whatever that case is. So that just shows, you know, through all these artists that you've worked with, it's that trust and that rapport. It's so, it's so funny. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. First, first of all, you know I'm a, a comic fiend. Yeah, I, I love everything. Love I, I love everything you guys do. But a friend of mine who is an engineer friend of mine who works with me with Gaga calls me the artist whisperer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, nobody's ever called me. He said, dude, I've seen you do stuff with these artists that I never have seen anybody else do. Not just, just a music director, just like anybody. And so there was one time when we were working on the Super Bowl with Gaga. And Gaga came in and she was working hard on this thing. I mean, we work hard on the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. and um, But this particular day, we had to do... Um, some work on something and she had to sing in the mic and I was there, you know, producing it. And um, let's just, let's just say she wasn't feeling like Gaga that day to me. Mm -hmm. And so I just got on the mic and I just said, yo, mama, come in. She was like, well, I'm not finished. I said, come on in. So she takes her headphones off and comes in. She's like, what's wrong, Michael? I was like, it's just not feeling right. It's not sounding good. It's not feeling right. It's just like, you should just go home tonight. But we need, we gotta, I was like, nah, it's not coming. Mm -hmm. But I can do, I was like, I know you can, but you can't do it tonight, go. And I just got forceful with her and she was just like taken aback by it. Not by me, cause that's why she- No, of course. You know, but she, so then she started saying all these things. Well, they got me running, blah, blah, blah. She started going, I was like, I understand. Mama, it's cool, it's not, it's, I, I don't care what the excuse is or what the reason is or whatever. Um, and she probably won't mind me telling this story, so. Um, but I was like, come back tomorrow or whenever the next time you can come back and let's work on it then. And then, so she did and she came back and killed it. Mm -hmm. And she, I told her to come in the room and I just hugged her. And she was like, thanks for firing me the other night. That's yeah. what she said to me. Because you knew what she needed. You knew because she needed I knew what break. she needed and she needed a break and she probably needed a mental break. And mm -hmm. you know, she's got a lot going on, a lot, a lot of stuff. And I always forget she's still a young woman. Yes. And so she still got all that going on too. But I just was able to say, but the reason I tell that story is nobody else in the room was gonna speak up. Yeah. Cause they, they, no they, they sitting anything. there knowing that it's not feeling cool. It drives me crazy. But nobody was gonna say anything. So I had to say it, but it was a way that I said it that made her, I mean, I'm sure she didn't feel good about it. Yeah. Um, but she, I didn't make her feel dejected or, you know. But, but it, to me, it shows that you care. It's just like if I see yes. uh, one thing that's frustrating, if, if I'm working with a comic and all the yes men are laughing at every line and you're going, and then they come off stage and everybody's like, man, that was great. You killed it tonight. Yeah. And then I got to be the one to go, hey, man, when you do that, but, you know, I have to be the one right. to like break through it and almost like it's not negative, but it could feel negative when right. everybody else is just, you know, telling you what you want to hear yeah you know i i want to um jump to the oscars the performance with gaga and bradley cooper okay how in the hell <laughs> did you guys come up with that and um that was what to me that was one of the best moments of the oscars was uh you and uh what was that moment Thank with you. lady gaga and bradley cooper performing um tell me the name of the song um so, uh, shallow shallow um, well, thank you for that. Um, well, Oscars, so how that particular performance happened, so we had, we, we did the Grammys too. Mm -hmm. 
and we have been playing. So, you know, I helped create uh, her two shows that are in, in, in Vegas. Vegas right now, her residencies, yeah. you know. So me and, and, and... Which I'm going to go see in October, but I want yes, to see... Yes, yes. You, you do her pop I show. I do her pop show and, and her, her jazz, jazz show. show. The uh, jazz show is what I really want to see because you're actually performing on the jazz show. I'm conducting on the jazz show. Yes. I conduct the orchestra. You know, there's 30 musicians on stage that connect to her. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And it's, it's a fun thing to play. I liken it to when Quincy Jones was Frank Sinatra's conductor. Okay. And so it's me and Gaga. And she and I know what that means and what it looks like. And uh, we go out there and do we do. We and how many now is do you guys do it in the you do it in the same venue, right? We do it in the same room. So the pop Whoa. show is her. I want how many people does it hold? Fifty four hundred. Fifty four hundred. Okay. Yeah. It's, oh wow, it's that's why it's such a hard ticket to get. It's a hard ticket to get because well, what the thing about it is, and we'll get back to the story. The thing about it is, she's bringing back the elegance of you know those whole Rat Pack days with Sinatra and you know mm -hmm. uh, Sammy Davis and all that. And, you know, a lot of the shows in Vegas are geared towards younger audiences. It's not like this is geared towards any specific age, but it's just to have that, that reverence of that, that music, you know, mm -hmm. the American Songbook in there. And she's, and she's probably the only artist uh, today that can do both like that. Well, I remember the first time I had seen glimpses of that when she sung that duet with um, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett. Yeah, well, in her record, with, they did a whole tour together too. Oh wow! So, and that 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 album won the Grammy and all that. Their duet tour, mm -hmm. uh, um, "Cheek to Cheek" is what it's called. And yeah. so, and so it, it it was born from that. And but I think you know the casino. She tells the story on the stage, so I'm not out of turn here. That you know they were a little hesitant about her doing a jazz show. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to do. And and so she says on, in the jazz show on the stage, she says, Get your, guess which show outsold, you know. So the, the jazz show is actually outsold the pop show. Wow. And so it's doing it's, it's doing extremely well, and she's doing an amazing job at it. And, you know, I'm on, on conducting it and making it swing I'm for her. I'm looking forward to it. And so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fun thing. And um, so, uh, uh, you know, we'll get to the Oscars. Uh, Super Bowl, to, to, to put a bow on that, we we do the Super Bowl after she comes in and, you know, when I told her to go home and she's killing and we then we go down to Houston and rehearse and do it all that. And it was the most watched Super Bowl halftime show in history. And I got it. Let them know, Mike. And I got an Emmy nomination for that. That's what's up, Mike. That's what I want to do. I had to put, like, closed mouths don't get fair. Y'all need to know this is going on. I need to know this. So Oscars, what happened is... Um, so we had done, we were at, at Vegas doing a residency, and, and so Bradley came one night and actually sang um, Shallow with, with Gox on, on the show, and everybody went crazy about it. And so I was talking to him afterwards, and we, we still didn't know if he wanted to do the Oscars or not, because that's a different thing for him. It's not like he couldn't sing. I, I did the movie too, uh, Stars Born. I'm in the movie, and mm -hmm. um, so it was, he was actually playing and singing and doing all that himself. Like he really worked hard at it. Oh wow! And he's really good at it. Good. He can actually sing, and which is what I told him. Mm -hmm. And um, but I still didn't and know. That, how great must it be for him to hear that coming from you? Well, that was who's worked with everybody that had to give him a bit of confidence. And you, it's funny you say that because I was me and Bradley and Gaga on side of the stage, and and. And I told him that, and she was there, and she goes, and he worked with Michael Jackson, and he worked with Whitney Houston, and he worked with, she was, co -sign, gotta she let him was know. co signed and I was looking at the guys like, all right, mama, like, yeah, okay, but she was, but she was saying just that, so, like, like, he knows, he's not, he he's knows. not he's just not gonna, gonna lie say to you. that, and, yeah. and, but, and she was right, I wasn't gonna lie, to, like, which was kind of the reason why she wanted me to hear, like, you know, how this might go, not, I mean, not like an audit, like it's Bradley Cooper. It's yeah. like, but it was, it was, you know, mainly him, you know, not saying that he was not confident in himself because he is. He's yeah. an amazing actor and amazing director, as we he's see. He's super talented. He's super man. talented and a really nice dude. And, That's um, great to hear, man. And so he just, I, I think it was more or less of this, like, you know, how he wanted to do it. So what, once he figured out the the scope of how he wanted to do it and how it could be done, and he, that's his visual. His vision. So was it so? It was his idea to come from the audience and walk on stage? Uh, well, I'm I'm not sure how we got there. That I, was so dope. To well, me, this man. is this is okay. So a lot of things happen when you're creating things. So of the course, first, the of first course. thing that happened was we had to do shallow at the Grammy. So I was like, we're about to do it at the Grammys and Oscars. It can't be the same thing. Yeah. So 
uh, Gaga came up with it, the vibe of let's do it in a rock vibe and you put it together. So we did it a rock kind of vibe on it and it and it worked. It came off. It did she did well. And That's so, what you guys did on the Grammys. This is what we did on the Grammys. Yeah. So for the Oscars it had to be totally different. And it was so, so stripped down. Which yeah. Was so and so I just got, you know, she asked me, like, do you know any pedal steel players? So get real technical musically is, you know, for country music when you hear the, <laughs> the pedal steel guitar player. Uh-huh. So I knew one. I actually just finished doing a, um, a Ray Charles tribute at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville. And so um, that's another long story. But I was the music director for that. The Ray Charles estate called me. And so, but the pedal steel player there, Tommy, uh, I love working with him. He's a great dude. So I brought him in to play with um, with Gaga on on that. Uh, the Grammys and, and the Oscars, actually. So we had that, and I had the, the band kind of stripped down. And so what we did was I, we started playing it and we messing around with it. And then, and then Mama wanted to sit down and play. But... You know, so Richie and I, uh, Richie Jackson, who's a choreographer um, and creative director, and uh, so we we sit and we look at how things look, Mm -hmm. and I look at how things sound, and we look at you know Richie's really great at staging, and so and so she was coming in, so Bradley's asking this, like, how should I sit? And so Richie's over there saying, I'm like, cool, and then we kind of put him to that way, and so and I'm and I'm telling him how to sing it, like. No, be on the mic. Like, you know, I'm mm-hmm. giving him his direction. I'm directing yes. Bradley Cooper. Yeah. Then uh, Mama comes in, and I, t- I call Gaga that. I know you call, so, he so, calls Gaga yeah, Mama. <laughs> I call her that or, you know, Gogs or, you know, whatever. And so she comes in, and um, baby girl, I call her sometimes. <laughs> so she comes in, and she's standing. And then R- Richie and I's idea was, because they have such a natural chemistry mm-hmm. together. It was yeah, like, they do. let's just use that. Let's just put, let's just make that, put that on display. So she was going to come in and sit down because she didn't want the transition to look funny or something. Like, Gaga's really very detailed, which is what I love working, uh, why I love collaborating with her. I don't mm-hmm. work for artists, I collaborate with. Yes. I work with artists. Yes. And, um, and I love, I love working with her is because she's so detailed, like down to drawing stuff. Like, I've seen her draw stuff. Like yeah. she's so amazing. Yeah. Really love, love working with her. And so, and so we saw we wanted to get that energy together. So Richie was like, "No, you should stand there." I was like, "Yeah, that's cool." And then Bradley was like, "Yeah, let's do." It. So this this is how things evolve. And so then then she was like, "Michael, does this look funny if I do this?" I'm like, "No, but you can go here." And then we'll go. And then she started singing. And long story short, we started staging it and getting it to where Bradley was walking around the piano and all that. And so then is the end moment. Mama wanted to keep playing, and I, at at the um, at the end, I would always go to her and like like take her hand off the piano. She would play, it and I just go. I'd be taking it off. She's like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "That moment should just be silent, no chord, nothing." I take her hand off the piano and, until she got it. Then she got it, and she kind of leaned back. And Bradley, I say, "That's the moment." Bradley was like, "Ooh!" <laughs> like, Bradley was like, "That's the shot." And so he figured out the shot and so i think we had actually decided we were in rehearsal and i I have it on video actually which i won't show but Mm -hmm. um we were coming in from the wings i think when we got to the venue bradley and gaga decided that it would be cooler if they came from the audience and just kind of you know just 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 like a a natural thing Not, not 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 like it was a big to do of like oh we're about to sing like like it was we just, just kind of so subtle man. just a subtle we're getting up we're going to perform like yeah. it was a it was a thing so because we wanted to be opposite of everything else that was going to happen so we were trying to anti- we hadn't we weren't privy to people's performances yeah we were just trying to anticipate to how people think yeah and so we were like no nah, everybody's doing this let's do this when they go right we go left come on man so and so that's what we did and so that's how it just kind of shaped and you know, I had the music right, and you know, the way we were playing it is like just it just all came together. Um, you know, and if you guys haven't seen, I know a lot of people don't watch the Oscars, um, but it's worth just. I'm sure they can find it online. Uh, Gaga and Bradley Cooper. It's one of my favorite things that I've done, and the really cool thing about it was when commercial break happened, and and there is a photo that I actually will probably send it to you. Okay, uh, of me and Gaga and Bradley and Richie. 
uh, and, and Bradley asking me, how, how was it? Was that? And, and Gaga, and they're looking at each other, and we're t- all talking about it. Then they go back out to their seats, and they get another standing ovation oh, wow. from the Hollywood crowd. That's so dope. I'm telling you, man. That's amazing I, that, It was me. one of the best performances yeah. I've seen on the Oscars. Congratulations, thank man. Thank you. I just want to thank you. I know how busy you are. The fact that you made time to come do the show. I mean, I hate that Johnny couldn't be here. I know Johnny wanted to be here also. But no, he didn't. We got to <laughs> we'll talk about him. I'm going to talk about you, Johnny. Talk it's, about it. I, don't, uh, I'm going to talk offline about you. How could you not be here when I when I was here? I didn't get home to 3 in the morning, and I have a film I got to go to score because I got to deliver it by Sunday night, and you, you couldn't be here to see me? Hey, you know Johnny loves you. Well, we got to have you back because here's Johnny. the thing. As, as, as long as this episode is – we didn't cover probably half. We just hit we the, didn't, we didn't the highlights because I think your life is amazing. I appreciate your friendship. And um, I love the fact that you're great at what you do. And I just want people to realize the job of a musical director because uh, a lot of people have no idea. And you've done the Oscars and the Emmys and all kinds of different award shows. And it just takes a tremendous amount of skill. And I uh, thank you for taking the time out and thank coming you. to do the thank show. Thank you for man. having me, Ruth. We appreciate you, man. Appreciate you, man. Love you, Yeah, boy. love you, too. So yeah. this is the great Michael Bearden. This is the best <laughs> of everything. You can listen. And Michael Bearden actually did the theme song to the podcast. Where my check. That, that ch- <laughs> and we're talking about that off here. <laughs> but he did the theme song just, and he literally did that just oh, off man. of the whole odd couple thing. If you, me and Johnny, you guys know he gets on my nerves. So you know that it's the whole odd couple. We love Johnny. Film. We love Johnny. Johnny's my brother. Yeah. But we got to have you back on because I know I he has. Love, yeah. He has so many other questions. Yeah, let's do I'm a part sure. two, two with him. Okay, that'll be awesome, we'll do man. That. All right. Okay. Give me your word that you're gonna come back. I'll come back. And do I don't the, know when I'm coming back. Yeah, I know, I know. I'll, but you, but I'll you'll come back, back and do I'll the show. I'll come back. So you can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play. You can see this on YouTube. And once again, the great Michael Berry. Yeah, and they got a real podcast. Yes, we got a real one, man. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and you guys already know, Ruby Tuesdays, every Tuesday yeah. night, Hollywood Laugh Factory, 930, best show in town. Yep. Thank you, guys. Ruby Mother and Tuesdays. This show is all about diversity and bringing everyone together. Yeah, Ruby Tunes does.